in how does God perceive the persecuted church? How does he deal with them? Let us find out how God's heart does that and then let our hearts follow his. When I read this in the context of preaching about the persecuted church, it reminded me of some uh, calls that I've made as a pastor. When I call on people, I try to engage them about what's going on in their lives, why I'm there, uh, and uh, if I can get them to smile a little bit, laugh a little bit, that can be a really good thing. Uh, but sometimes you go into a room and you can tell from the demeanor on a person's, uh, in this, their whole countenance is just tired and weak and weary. They're in pain, they're in lots of pain. Uh, and there's no kind of laughter at all that seems appropriate at the time. Uh, they're just striving to breathe and to stay alive for whatever reason. And uh, so you try to speak words of encouragement into their life. And uh, that's how I feel when I read about the church in Smyrna. Of the seven churches that were addressed in Revelation, this is the only church that falls under absolutely no criticism at all. Now, I think, you know, it's a church. Every church is probably worthy of criticism, <laughs> just like all of us are worthy of criticism. But sometimes we see certain people, and even though everything isn't perfect in their life, this is not the time to be uh, shoring up their problems. This is a time to come underneath, and this is a time to, to encourage. So we read in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 2, and the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. These are the words of Jesus. Okay, These are the words of Jesus. One of the commentators pointed out that Smyrna was a city, a very ancient city that had been absolutely destroyed by the Persians and then brought back to life uh, by the generals of Alexander the Great uh, and was wondering if that had anything to do with the opening words identifying uh, Jesus and his death and resurrection uh, because these were people who he was writing to who are close to death and their hope, their hope, is in their resurrection with Jesus. Verse 9 says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. It's almost like, but remember, you're rich. And I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but they are not. They are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I pray, as always, that your word would come alive in our own hearts. You would take the knowledge that you've given us, Lord, the experiences that you've given us, and allow us to see you and know your heart in ways, Lord, that change us and make us into children and servants for your kingdom, Lord, that, uh, that serve you well and honorably. We give this time to you, Father. Please guide our thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we read this letter, the church in Smyrna, uh, and the persecution described here, and throughout the history of the church, some of us, and I doubt so much in this church, because these are things we try to keep before us, uh, but we might be tempted to think, boy, how blessed we are that all those days are over. 
okay? That that stuff doesn't happen anymore. Uh, but if we were tempted to say that, we would be wrong. Uh, some may be surprised to find out that Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world today. Christianity Today, the magazine, once claimed uh, that more believers died for their faith in Christ in the 20th century alone than in all 19th century since the founding of the church. And now, here in the 21st century, we are seeing even more persecution against Christians because of the practice of their faith. And it's taking place today in alarming proportions in many countries around the world. Open Doors USA, an information and advocacy group, reports that at least 100 million Christians are being persecuted for their faith worldwide uh, each month. I don't know about you, I can't get my mind around a number like that. A hundred million Christians. 322 Christians are killed for their faith uh, daily. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed daily. 772 forms of violence were committed against Christians, such as beatings and abductions and rapes and arrests, forced marriages, and so on. Open Doors claims that 2015 was the worst year in modern history for Christian persecution, last year. Every evening we can turn on the world news and we can track the violent advance of ISIS, especially in Iraq and in Assyria, displacing Christians and persecuting Christians who would not convert to Islam. They mark the Christian's home with the Arabic letter N. It's on the front of your bulletin. It stands for Nazarene. By the way, Kate Hatbarth, I noticed, used this is, if you go to her Facebook page, this is her picture, is this N. I imagine Kate's way of reminding her uh, that this is something that she needs to pray for, and in a secondary sense, reminding me whenever one of her posts comes up. And I have to, I'm just going to be confessionary here. All of this persecution is very, very far away. And one of my struggles is to keep it close so that I care, so that I pray, so that I do what I can do, so that I use the resources that God gives me, not just because of a head knowledge, but somehow I need to get it down here. And it's hard to get these things down here when you're not experiencing them or it's not a firsthand struggle for you. And this is the kind of information that, that I know is out there, but it doesn't get it down deep, but we still need to know it. The Iraqi Christian community is one of the oldest Christian communities in the entire world, and it's nearly disappeared with, just within the last few years. More than 140,000 Christians have fled Iraq for their lives. Those who stayed behind are in constant danger of disenfranchisement, torture, rape, and murder. In Syria, a nation that's just being torn to pieces right now, 700,000 Christians have fled from their homes. Persecutors have tortured and even crucified those who resist. How many people live in Madison? A little over 200,000, something like that? Does that sound right? Okay, 700,000. Christians fled. A year ago, we saw the horrific images of a video <clears throat> that showed ISIS terrorists shooting and beheading some uh, 21 uh, and then 30 Ethiopian Christians on a beach in Libya while the Christians prayed. These images are seared into our collective memory and our heart-wrenching reminder of the cost paid, for our, paid by our brothers and sisters for following Jesus. In Sudan, very near to where uh, Ken Gradel is, they uh, 
are trying to impose Muslim religion on all citizens there, and some two million have died. Most of them because of their Christian faith. They're not just killing Christians in the Sudan. Christian children have been sold into slavery there and many into prostitution. Recently, two reporters who were there purchased six girls for the price of two cows. Shows you what the value of human flesh is there. In Saudi Arabia, where they have zero protection for Christians, citizens are paid a bounty of $3,000 for exposing home Bible studies. In Pakistan, speaking against Muhammad and for Christ is punishable by death. In fact, a Christian husband and his pregnant wife were burned alive by a mob of 1,200 people after a local mosque stoked allegations of blasphemy against them. Most recently, a group of Christians gathered at an amusement park. You saw this in the news, probably also, in Lahore, Pakistan. And they were victims of a bombing there. The blast tore through the park, claiming the lives of 69 people, mostly women and children, and injuring 350 more. The explosives were detonated by a suicide bomber next to a park where Pakistani Christians had just gathered after their Easter services. The target said the members of the Pakistani Taliban were Christians. But persecution's not only intense in Muslim nations. In North Korea, you can be executed for owning a Bible. Between 50 and 70,000 Christians are currently subjected to brutalization in prison camps by the repressive communist dictatorship. In Nigeria, thousands of Christians were killed and hundreds of churches attacked in 200, 2015. And when we think of Nigeria, we usually think of that as being a Christian nation. They have a Christian president. But the northeast part of Nigeria uh, is pretty much run by uh, Muslim uh, terrorists. I'll say more about uh, Nigeria in a few minutes. In India, the largest democracy in the world, Hindu nationalists have repeated atta repeatedly attacked Christians, and one said his group's aim was to ensure that Islam and Christianity cease to exist in India. In China, their official policy and goal is to wipe out every underground house church in existence. House churches operate independently of governmental control and are perceived to be a threat to the communist regime. Christians who are caught expressing their faith in a manner that the government deems illegal have been beaten and tortured with, uh, tortured with cattle prods, electric drills, and many of them are sent off to labor camps or just killed. Okay, we know these atrocities happen. It's easy to walk out of a room like here, this and grow cold quickly. It still seems abstract when it's just words because our wealth of experiences really doesn't allow us to grasp these realities on an emotional level. Some do, many cannot. Head level, yes. But it's hard to penetrate deep enough to reach our hearts and our souls, enough to change the way we live daily. We try to personalize some of these terrors Consider uh, Damaris. Damaris is our sister in Christ. Damaris lives in Nigeria. Damaris and those of here who are believers share a common confession. As Christians, our lives are drawn from the same divine source. 
we are inextricably connected to the Mars by the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We live together with her in the same household of faith. We have the same Father who gave us life, and Jesus is our brother. And although we've never and probably never will in this world meet her face to face, we will spend eternity with her. This sister of ours was widowed in 2010 when her husband, our brother, was beaten to death by the Sunni fundamentalist Islamic sect Boko Haram. Boko Haram originally had ties to Al-Qaeda, but have since claimed an association with the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. This is the word ISIL. Sometimes you hear our president will usually say ISIL, others will say ISIS, and all has to do with the last letter, whether the group is identifying with Syria or Levant. Boko Haram is considered to be the worst of all of the world's terrorist groups and have, since 2009, killed 20,000 people and displaced, because of their fear of them, 2.3 million. Okay. You may remember the girls' school that was raided, and I think it was about 237 girls were taken. And you know to this day, uh, most of them are still gone. A few of them escaped. Widowed Damara must now support and care for her four children alone. Her words, it's not easy, but my Lord is faithful. Asked if she could forgive those who killed her husband because he was a Christian, she said, I will forgive. Because if I will not forgive, the Lord Jesus will not forgive me. It's not easy. But God will give me the grace to love. And she added, I want to live a life that will glorify God and be a model for my children. Pray for me that I will be strong and courageous. Consider Kalia, an Iraqi Christian in her 50s now, who was captured and held hostage along with 47 others. During her 15 days in captivity, she rejected demands to convert, despite a gun being put to her head and a sword pushed into her neck. She literally, physically fought off ISIS militants as they tried to rape the girls who were uh, in the room with her. And again later, they tried to take a nine-year-old as a bride. Because of the abuse, 14 men who had been captured gave in to ISIS demands and said that they would convert to Islam, but Kalia would not. Ultimately, the hostages were left in the desert to die, and somehow they were able to walk to Erbil. Kurdistani people know of this woman. They call her the woman. The woman who saved many people. You see, that's my sister. That's your sister in Christ. When we read God's word, we relate it to our own lives based on what we already know and understand. How differently do we understand Jesus' words offered in the Sermon on the Mount than would Kalia and Damaris? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Will you rejoice and be glad? 
for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And the same risen Lord who offers his disciples this blessing sends a letter to a troubled but triumphant church in the city of Smyrna to, to encourage them as they persevered through persecution. There's a great lesson in the information of the Bible about the city where God puts you having a profound impact Pact on the kind of ministry he wants uh, you to do, or whatever, however he wants you to be involved in his work. Uh, he put you in Baraboo or in the countryside or in Reedsburg or in uh, Portage or perhaps Sauk. Some come from Linden Station, some come from other places even farther. But wherever God puts you, he has put you there for a reason. And where he puts you should affect what you do for him. As we read about the city of Smyrna, we find that the nature of this city itself profoundly impacts the nature of the church and its ministry and what was happening to the Christians there. The city of Smyrna was named after its chief product. It was a spice known as, what do you think? Smyrna. It's where myrrh was made. And myrrh was an aromatic extract made from the gummy sap of a thorny species of tree. It's interesting that two of the largest cities in Turkey both have names related to these trees. Smyrna, which is its name from myrrh, and bursa, which is the kind of trees that it comes from. Uh, I think they're both in the top five largest cities in Turkey. Myrrh was traditionally used to embalm the dead, and the word Smyrna actually occurs three times in the New Testament with reference to Jesus at his birth, at his crucifixion, and at his burial. Smyrna is just another way of saying myrrh, and this city got its name from that spice. And it was known around the world and consequently, it made the city very, very wealthy. Smyrna was a proud community. In fact, their coins proclaimed themselves as the first city of Asia. The city dates back to the third millennium BC. As I said before, it was destroyed by the Persians, but rebuilt by the generals of Alexander the Great after he had conquested, uh, uh, after he had, uh, uh, had conquest in that area. It was an important city in the Roman Empire, and it was unique in its day because it was rebuilt. When it was rebuilt, it was a planned city. Most cities don't get planned. They just kind of build up. But uh, it was one of the first planned cities in the Greco-Roman world. The historian Aristides likened it to a beautiful statue. The city had a highway system, a well-built harbor, and trade flourished. It was one of the richest, most beautiful cities in Asia Minor. Today, Smyrna is known as Izmir and is the third largest city in Turkey, according to my notes. Okay. In the first century, the people of Smyrna were fiercely loyal to Rome. And in 195 BC, Smyrna was the first city in history to dedicate a temple to the worship of the goddess Rome. Historians record that when the Roman armies were bogged down with their, in their war with Persia in 95 BC, the soldiers were ill-clothed to, continu to continue in the winter. And when the word of this misfortune came to the city of Smyrna, the inhabitants stripped themselves of their clothes and sent them by special envoy in order to demonstrate their loyalty. Cicero, the famous Roman orator, noted that of all the cities in the East, Smyrna was the most loyal to Rome. This was a city that bred loyalty. And it affected not just the pagans, but it affected the Christians also. 
The people of Smyrna were so proud of being Romans that they wanted to show their gratitude for the benefits of the empire by worshiping the one who embodied the empire, the emperor himself. And in AD 26, around the time Jesus' ministry began, Smyrna won a competition amongst the cities of Asia for the site of a temple for the worship of Emperor Tiberius. They prided themselves as they worshiped all things Roman, and their loyalty to Caesar was unquestioned. The church at Smyrna, however, took great pride in their loyalty to Christ. They refused to worship Caesar at the temple, and this resulted in conflict, confrontation, and persecution. It was, it was radically countercultural. And Christians were perceived in that city as people who undermined the true strength and traditional loyalties of the city. Indeed, the church was accused of treason. By the way, if you pay attention to your own society right now, we see these themes, same kind of themes, being leveled against Christians. That Christians, because of their doggedness and their dogma, uh, are bad for the country. The Roman Emperor Domitian, <clears throat> who reigned from uh, 81 to 96 AD, declared that everyone in the empire <coughs> excuse me, must burn incense and worship him as the supreme deity. He only received his mail when it was addressed to him, the Lord and God Domitian. Under these conditions, the church in Smyrna was brutalized. Their loyalty to Jesus was exemplary, and they suffered severe persecution, and many were executed because of their faith. There's a man that I've met a couple times. His name is Pastor Kenyon Curitan. He is currently the vice president for church ministries with the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. And the FRC's website offered pastors one of Kenyon's sermons as an example to use for Persecuted Church Sunday. And I read it, and I was blessed by all that the Lord said through him. But I particularly appreciated the manner in which he outlined what he called the Lord's commendation of the church in Smyrna. Whereas in our text, the translators use the word tribulation, testing, and poverty, Kenyon presented the Lord's commendation of the church because it would be because the church would stand under pressure, poverty, and persecution. So he just used different words to say the same thing that the ESV, our translation, the one that we're currently using, uh, used. About pressure that the persecuted church was feeling. Kenyon writes that the Greek word flipsis translate as, and it's trans, that word is translated as afflictions in the NIV and tribulations in the ESV, comes from a root word that means to be crushed, a pressure that breaks. When you think about it, the name of the city itself perfectly describes the church because myrrh is produced by crushing the branches of a thorny tree so that the sap oozes out. And in Smyrna, the believers were constantly crushed until the perfume, and I love uh, Kenyon's wording here, until the perfume of their suffering filled the city and was a pleasing aroma before the throne of God. But they were under constant pressure because they would not bow down to Caesar and thereby declare their loyalty to Rome. They refused to burn a pinch of incense on the altar and confess, Caesar Curios, Caesar is Lord. Caesar, by the way, in Latin is where the Germans get the word what, you know? Kaiser, <laughs> Kaiser Wilhelm and others. Uh, but it really wasn't so much an act of religious devotion as it was an act of political persuasion. But the Christians said, no. The title of the Lord is reserved for one name and one name alone. Christos Curios. Christ is Lord. 
Christians would walk up to the altar before the statue of the spirit of Rome and they would throw the incense on the ground. And instead of saying Caesar is Lord, they would say Christ is Lord. This was the treason and the blasphemy. These words mark them as traitors to Rome and the emperor, and they now lived under constant threat of death, pressing weight on their lives, pressing weight of impending doom. The pressure on Christians from the pagans in Smyrna was constant. There was never a moment of relief, never a day off. There was a constant unrelenting pressure to be a Caesar worshiper. Some of you understand this a little bit, what it's like to be under constant pressure to conform to something which doesn't please God and to be crushed in a hostile environment, whether it be at school or at work, or still worse, some of you in your own homes. Amy Johnson Flint was a prolific poet who wrote between the 19th and 20th centuries, and her poems reflect the power of her faith that were forged through the crucible of her own life, which was a difficult life. Listen to this poem about the pressures of life. She wrote, pressed out of measure and pressed to all length, pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength, pressed in the body and pressed in the soul, pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll, pressure by foes and pressure by friends, pressure on pressure till life nearly ends, pressed into loving the staff and the rod, pressed into knowing no helper but God. Jesus tells the church in Smyrna, I know the pressure. I understand what it is to be under the crushing strain of opposition. If there's anyone here uh, serving under pressure, you may feel like you're standing alone. You may feel like you're bearing the brunt of opposition by yourself and the constant pressure you might feel is about to crush you. But our risen Lord says, I know what you are going through because I have been there. He says, I know that you live with pressure. And then secondly, he says, I know that you live with poverty. The poverty the church in Smyrna was experiencing was extreme. It was magnified by the wealth that surrounded it. You always feel poorer when there's wealthy people next to you. The Christians were shunned economically. The guilds, no doubt, disallowed the membership of the Christians. They would be removed from any employment and dependency, uh, any employment dependent upon the government. People on the streets would refuse to buy or sell to them and at least, at least in public. Property was seized, landowners would refuse to rent, and life was lived day to day with no reserves. But notice that the Lord, what the Lord tells them. He says, you need to remember that you are rich. And this, of course, was a reminder that they have him. And if they have him, in spite of their suffering, they have the source of absolutely everything. Pressure, poverty, and persecution. Jesus calls these Jews, who are, who are the primary source of their suffering, the synagogue of Satan. And apparently the Jews were still stirring up trouble just as they did in the days of Paul. False rumors were circulating. People were being turned against the church by this affluent vocal group of Jewish leaders. People believing the lies that they wanted to believe. Jesus knew slander. About him, they said, he's a glutton and a drunk. They said, he's demon-possessed. They told Jesus, they said about Jesus that he is the product of fornication. And they said, he is a blasphemer. Today, if you belong to a church that believes in the authority of God's word, you will be accused of a whole host of things on the evening news or at a school board meeting. You will be accused of being a bigot, 
or a racist or a homophobe or a misogynist or a Nazi or a cult member. I'm sure there's more that's all that I could remember at midnight. <laughs> but good grief, if people believed all the things that people say about us Christians, no wonder they don't like us. <laughs> I wouldn't like us either. It's enough to make someone want to leave here for good. Because if you go to this church, you're going to take up that identification by people who hate God's word. Even if it isn't true, people will believe it. Why stay around? Certainly there must be another church who believes the same things we believe, that they just don't make such a big deal about it. Less pressure, no names, lower profile. Let's get out of here. I'm not suggesting that, by the way. <laughs> Hope you understood that the way it was intended. But certainly the believers in Smyrna were tempted to leave and to go to another city where Christians had become more mainstream. Perhaps some did, but Smyrna is the only church amongst the seven that wasn't rebuked for some sin or another. What did God want them to do? Cut and run? No. Nope. God told the persecuted church to be fearless and to be faithful. Fearless and faithful. In fact, you remember Damaris's testimony. That's what she prayed for herself. Verse 10 says, God tells the church to be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. Early on in that same verse, God says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Don't fear what's coming. And you be faithful right up until you breathe your last breath. Because on the other side of the grave, I will be there, and you will receive the crown of life. I really believe it's important to take note of what the Lord does not say to them. He doesn't say to them, pray to the heavens that I will deliver you. He doesn't say to them, I will utterly destroy your enemies. Not at this point in time. He doesn't say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their voice from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. He doesn't say that to Smyrna. He didn't say, pray the right prayers in the right way and I will take care, take all of your pain away. He didn't say, don't worry about your children. I will save them and give them long life in the land and bless them for ten generations. He doesn't say that to them. No, what he tells Smyrna is be brave because it's going to hurt. He says be faithful because you're going to die. But in death you are going to be rewarded with the crown of life. And the time has come for this life to pass. But don't worry. I am here with you to carry you into eternity. Be strong. Be faithful. It will be worth it all. Trust me. Years ago, Shepherd's Home in Union Grove, Wisconsin, had a three-man church relations team that would visit uh, and update supporting churches on their ministry. Uh, Shepherd's Home was a home for severe, is a se home for severely mentally retarded and disabled children. And eventually, over the years, it's now pretty much a home for adults. The team that went from church to church consisted of Shepherd's president, Dr. Woods, and two of the residents there, Butch and Steve. How many remember Butch and Steve? Uh, Butch and Steve were amazing men who, in spite of their severe mental disabilities, had a capacity for scripture memorization that was absolutely amazing. Communication was hard for both of them, but communicate they did, and with a clarity that was beyond reason. Services would always end the same way. Stephen would stand behind the pulpit and he would sing. And this is what he would sing. 
é o El P was it all when we see Jesus and it would come out and it would come out he would sing life's trials will seem so small when we see him one glimpse of his dear face all sorrow will erase. So, bravely run the race until we see Christ. Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, help us to live with our persecuted brothers and sisters across the globe. Lord, for whatever persecution you bring in our life, help us to deal with it obediently the same way. Help us to be brave. Help us to be faithful. Help us to speak the truth, Lord. Help us to be your children. Do not let us falter. Do not let us fail you. And help us to love, Lord, with your love, beyond our capacity to love. Lead us on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.